Well, if you have a Bible, uh, please turn to the Song of Songs. If you can't find it, just uh, the words will be on the screen as well. Song of Songs, chapter 6, um, verses 4 to 12. And your Bible, depending on what Bible it is, it might have the headings a bit different, but this is the one we'll follow, which is on the screen. So the shepherd. You are beautiful as Tisra, my love, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn away your eyes from me, for they overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes that have come up from the washing. All of them bear twins. Not, even one among them has, has lost its young. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. There are sixty queens and eighty concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one of her mother, pure to her who bore her. The young women saw her and called her blessed. The queens and concubines also there praised her. Who is this who looks down like the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? Shulamite. I went down to the nut orchard to look at the blossoms of the valley, to see whether the vines had budded and whether the pomegranates were in bloom. Before I was aware, my desire set me among the chariots of my kinsman, a prince. Well, it's great to be back in the Song of Songs after a few weeks' break. Um, it's one of those more mysterious books of the Bible. Many people avoid it. Um, but we've sought to preach all the way through it here at Gisborne. And um, so, so the last time we looked at the song a few weeks ago, and we saw that some time had passed since the wedding of the shepherd boy and the Shulamite woman. And the honeymoon period was well and truly over. And like all married couples, they'd now got into conflicts and into disagreements. It wasn't domestic duties which had caused this, it wasn't not putting the toilet seat down or, living, or leaving your trainers in the living room. It wasn't tricky relationships with the in-laws which had caused it. And the struggle that the marriage couple were having was in the area of intimacy. And when you read the Song of Songs chapter 5, it's clear the Shulamite woman had lost some of her passion for the shepherd boy. And those troubles of the day had become a dream of the night. In chapter 5, you see this dream sequence unfold. And the pictures are pretty obvious. The woman's in bed, and the man, he comes, he knocks at the door, and he says, Open to me, my sister, my bride. Approaching her for sexual intimacy. And but she makes her excuses. She says, well, I can't put my robe back on. I can't quite be bothered to get out of bed and respond and... It's some quite lame excuses you see there in Song of Songs chapter 5. But eventually she comes round to the idea of intimacy and she gets up to open the door to him. And But in the dream, he's gone, he's vanished. And so because this is a dream, she makes a very unwise choice. She goes out into the night by herself. She wanders about in the city. And the watchmen of the city, they see her, a woman alone at night like this, and they think perhaps the woman is a prostitute. And so they give her a beating. It's a strange dream in many ways. And just when you think it couldn't get much stranger, all of a sudden she realizes that it is a dream and that the shepherd boy has been with her the whole time. He's in the garden of their love. He's committed to her in covenant faithfulness. He's not gone anywhere. It's all been in her imagination. Even though there was conflict in real life, this was all just a dream. Now, as you looked at this dream, it reveals to us that married couples can have serious conflicts in the areas of intimacy. It's actually a reminder of what Paul says to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, married couples are not to deprive one another of sexual intimacy, except by mutual consent for a short time of prayer. That's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 7. You can find all that, all that information. It's plain advice, and it's advice that couples ignore 
um, to their own hurt, actually. It causes a lot of problems when one spouse withholds sexual intimacy from the other. But this passage didn't just contain wisdom for married couples, otherwise it wouldn't speak to everyone here in this room. Uh, Thinking beyond the natural to the supernatural, we saw that this passage had much to teach us about our relationship with Christ. Sometimes, just like the woman in the story, we're cold of heart, we're spiritually backsliding, and Christ comes into our lives to knock on the door and to seek fellowship with us. He knocks on the door of our life and he invites us to come into deeper fellowship with him. And sometimes we say, later on, Lord, I'm busy. I'm watching the television. I'm busy with the kids. I'm busy with the family. Perhaps some other time we'll go into deeper fellowship. So it also speaks to us of our relationship with the true shepherd, Jesus Christ. It was a challenge for us that when we find ourselves cold of heart and and sleepy, we had to get up and go looking for Christ. We had to take the rebuke of the watchman, the gospel minister, who points you to Christ. You had to listen to the advice of other Christians. And pretty soon, you will find Christ again. This is the ups and downs of the spiritual life which none know about, except those who are Christians and who are in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So the Song of Songs, it's a bit like you're watching an opera now. So that dream sequence is finished, and now the woman, then it, you know, like in the next scene almost, is approaching the man after the argument. And the question which pops up in our minds is how will the shepherd boy act towards his wife after she's been withholding intimacy from him? Or will he give her the cold shoulder in return? Or will he repair evil for evil? Or perhaps he'll just be sulky and passive aggressive. Or maybe he'll blow up and get outright angry. There's many different options of how you can behave after a serious argument, isn't there? Or will he be, he be willing to forgive and to move forward? Are the answer we find tonight in our passage. And as we look at this conversation between the shepherd and the Shulamite this evening... We get insights on how to respond to conflicts within our own marriages when they come up. How we can show godly forgiveness when our husband or our our wife has let us down. And as we consider just how gracious the shepherd is with his bride, we go beyond this to the greater shepherd and to the one that the Song of Solomon is always pointing us, us to, to Jesus Christ. And we ask the question, how does God respond to you and to me after we've sinned and we seek to return to him? How does he respond to his sinning people when they return to him? Does he give us the cold shoulder? Or does he put us on probation? All this and more will be revealed as we go through the passage together. Now I've got two points to help break down our thinking as we travel through this text. The first thing we'll see is the restoring grace of the shepherd boy to the Shulamite. Looking at how gracious he is when his wife returns to him. And secondly, after that, we'll look at the restoring grace of Christ to his people. How does Jesus respond to his people when they turn back to him in repentance? And it's my prayer that as we look at this passage, we'd be better at forgiving one another in our marriages, in our friendships, in our, you know, in church. And that also we'd have a greater appreciation for the forgiveness which we have been shown in Christ if we are believers. So first then, let's look together at the restoring grace of the shepherd boy to the Shulamite. Now, if you're honest, and if you're married... You know there are times when we're not at our best with one another. That's true, isn't it? Sometimes we have big heated arguments which we are not proud of. Some of our arguments, if they were up on the screen, uh, we'd feel quite ashamed of them for other people to see how we've behaved. Be sure of this, when two sinners live together, seeking to be faithful to the covenant they've made before God, 
There is going to be trouble at some point. Eventually, there will always be conflicts. Any married person will tell you exactly the same thing I'm saying tonight. It's one of the reasons the Apostle Paul said, those who marry will have trouble in the flesh, and I would spare you that. Sometimes we have conflicts in our marriage, and there's been a conflict here in the Song of Solomon. So what's the shepherd boy going to do? Is he going to dress down his wife? Is he going to make her feel ashamed for how she's treated him? Take a look with me at verse 4 as he begins to speak to his wife. He says, You are beautiful as Tisra, my love, lovely as Jerusalem, and awesome as an army with banners. Now let's be honest. That's not how, how we always respond to conflict, is it? You know, sometimes we say, good, you should feel sorry. You should feel stink because of what you've done. I'm not going to forgive you that easily. Sometimes when we've been sinned against, we can be very slow to forgive the other person. It takes a person of considerable grace to show grace to other people, doesn't it? You know, this is why it says in the book of Proverbs that it is man's glory to overlook an offense. It's man's glory to overlook an offense. It's the most fitting thing a sinner can do is to quickly forgive another sinner. So immediately the moment she's come back to the shepherd boy, the very first interaction after the conflict, he has three items of praise for her. At firstly, he says she's beautiful as Tisra. At Tisra was an ancient city of the east. It's also one of the names of the daughters of Zeholophad in the Old Testament. Uh, translating it from the literal Hebrew, it would literally be accepted, or she is my delight. And she would have understood this, obviously, in, in the context in which it was spoken. He's saying to her, I accept you, I forgive you, I delight in, in, in you. You are mine. Straight away, straight off the bat, he affirms his affection for her. Secondly, he affirms a loveliness. He says, you're as lovely as Jerusalem, as lovely as the city that God has chosen for his own abode. He still has affection for her. He still finds her lovely. She's not so unpleasant to him, even though she's been turning him away. He loves her. He delights in her. His third prayer is he says that she is as awesome as an army with banners. It's one of those strange Old Testament compliments, isn't it? A woman might not respond very well today if he said, you're as awesome as an army with banners. But in the Old Testament, it, you know, it's a picture of strength and dignity, isn't it? The armies of Israel who went out on God's mission. He's saying, you're full of strength and, and dignity, and I love you for who you are. Completely different to how we often respond. And maybe when you've been having a really bad argument, you've said to your spouse, get out of my sight. I can't stand to look at you. Or words to that effect. Well, in verse 5, it sounds like that's what the shepherd boy is saying, doesn't it? He says, turn away your eyes from me. But the reason, look in verse 5 again, it says, for they overwhelm me. It's the exact opposite of get out of my sight. He's saying, you're so beautiful. I'm enraptured with you. I'm taken up with you. I love you so much. It's almost overwhelming. His love for her has not changed one bit. And just to reinforce the fact that it's exactly the same as it was before the argument, I take a look at verses five and six. It might sound familiar to those of you who've been coming here for a few weeks in this series. It says, your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes that have come up from the washing. All of them bear twins, and not one among them has lost its young. It's as if he's pressed copy and paste from one of the earlier chapters, isn't it? Now, why has he done that? It's, be, it's so that she will know he feels exactly the same about her after the argument as before the argument. He gives her the same compliments. His grace towards her has not changed at all. He praises her just as he did in the courtship during the marriage. It's an example some of us men could definitely learn from, isn't it? 
to compliment our wives the way we did when we were caught in, uh, full of hormones and full of love and that new experience. The shepherd boy praises her the same way when he's caught in as he does in the marriage. And that's actually explicit in verse 7. It said, your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. You know, that's a very Hebrew sort of way of saying, you, you know, you're just as beautiful as you were on our wedding day. You know, the Eastern bride would have had the veil on as we sometimes still see in modern weddings. It's said, you're just as beautiful as on our wedding day. Just as beautiful. Now, the Shulamite woman is very insecure. As you go through the Song of Songs, you often find her doubting the shepherd's affection for her. She's worried that one of the other ladies in the village might take him away. And so the shepherd boy assures her that after this big season of arguing, he's not looking to trade her in for a younger, more beautiful model. He's still going to be with his wife. Now take a look at verses 8 and 9. It says, there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. You know, he's probably thinking here of King Solomon, who had, um, who had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And she's seen Solomon's bride going past. She's thinking, maybe the shepherd boy is going to trade me in like King Solomon and just get a new bride, one who doesn't talk back as much. Maybe he's going to cast me to one side. And he says, no, there's all these queens, there's all these virgins in the palace, but you are my dove, my perfect one, the only one pure to her mother. The young woman saw her and called her blessed. The queens and concubines there praised her. So although the woman might be scared that the shepherd, shepherd boy is going to be sick of her, nothing could be further from the truth. She is perfect and pure in his eyes. She is better than any other woman that the world has to offer. On the contrary, the queens and concubines, they look at what the Shulamite woman has with the shepherd and they're jealous of it. Because King Solomon, he could give them all these things, but he could never give them exclusive covenantal love. And so the queens and the concubines, they call her blessed. He wouldn't trade her in for a younger model in a thousand years. He's fully committed to his bride. Now we're in verse 10. He gets to the very climax of his prayers. He's using that love language which is really mushy and gushy and which people who are in love speak to one another. Verse 10. He says, Who is this who looks down like the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? It's a very Old Testament way of saying, your beauty is out of this world. One picture isn't enough to describe it. The moon, the sun, great armies, none of them can capture what you mean to me. He certainly knew how to encourage his wife after the mess in chapter 5, didn't he? He praised her, he encouraged her, he told her she was still utmost in his affections. And all this, it has the desired effect. The woman is basically swept off her feet in verses 11 and 12. Look with me there. She says, I went down to the nut orchard to look at the blossoms of the valley, to see whether the vines had budded and whether the pomegranates were in bloom. Now, this is quite difficult uh, poetic imagery here, but uh, their relationship has been compared to a garden over and over again in the Song of Solomon. And she's saying, I went down to inspect the garden, to inspect the relationship, and to see if there were any fresh flowers of love for me, to see if there was anything left of your affection for me. And what did she find? Verse 12, it says, Before I was aware, my desire set me among the chariots of my kinsmen, a prince. Uh, One scholar says that's the trickiest verse to translate in the entire Bible in the Old Testament. But basically it means she's been treated like a princess. She's been swept off her feet, amazed that he would be so kind and so gracious to her after her behavior to him. It's a wonderful picture of restoring grace and forgiveness, isn't it? It shows us if we're to have a good relationship with our spouse, we need to learn to forgive, to move on, to speak words of affirmation, 
and to choose to love one another because love covers over a multitude of sins. Now it's nice to read about this in a poem as you watch the Song of Song unfolding, but it's much harder in real life to be this forgiven, isn't it? To not harbor bitterness in our hearts, especially when our spouse lets us down again and again and again. And so a question pops up. How is it that we can forgive like the shepherd does? How can we bless instead of curse? How can we speak words of affirmation rather than condemnation, even when we're the ones who've been sinned against? Well, in order to get the answer to that question, you have to move beyond the natural to the supernatural. And it's this which leads us to our second point. We've seen the restoring grace of the shepherd boy to his bride. But now let's consider together the restoring grace of Christ to his church. The restoring grace of Christ to his church. Now, as we've seen continually week after week after week, the shepherd boy is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He pursues a woman, marries her, and she continues to sin against him again and again and again. And he continues all his life putting up with her faults in the most gracious way imaginable until she's spotless and pure. That is the picture of Jesus Christ in the Bible. He commits himself to his bride forever in covenant love. He puts up with her and he encourages her always. Even when she's not the bride, she ought to be. And that's really the key to being able to forgive other people. The key to being patient and gracious with others is that you know just how much God has been patient and gracious with you. When you know how much Jesus Christ has forgiven you of your sins and how bad you are and how much you keep sinning against them, it helps you to have more grace for other people in your marriage, in your home, in your relationships with others in the church and in the world. This is why Paul says to us, forgive one another just as Christ forgave you. There's the fuel to help you forgive others, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. You want to love one another? Love one another as Christ has loved you. You want to bear with one another in love? Bear with one another the way Christ has borne with you. All these truths are absolutely foundational to a healthy marriage, to a healthy relationship with one another, to a healthy church, to a healthy anything. Without the grace of Christ shown to us, without understanding his free and full forgiveness, the salvation he gives to us as a free gift, we're going to struggle to forgive others and be gracious with them also. So given that that's the case, I suppose we best spend a few minutes considering that love, considering how great a forgiveness it is that Christ gives to us as his people. Let's look again at these verses from a heavenly perspective. So like the woman, we sin against our saviour, but then the spirit of God begins to work in our hearts. He begins to convict us of our sins and very quickly we feel a desire to return to him, to confess to him. How does God act towards us when we do that? Well, take a look at verse four. This is Christ speaking to his church. He says, you are beautiful as Tisra, my love, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. You know, Jesus Christ is the one who could cast the first stone, isn't he? He's the one who could rub our sins in our faces if he wanted to. But his nature is to forgive his people. Rather than pouring condemnation on our guilty head, he forgives us and he embraces us. He reassures us of his grace towards us. He says, you're beautiful as Tisra, which means, as I said in the Hebrew, you are accepted, you are my beloved. He assures us of our salvation, those of us who know Christ. He says, you are mine, I have redeemed you, do not fear, you are accepted in me. Not only that, he calls us lovely as the city of Jerusalem. And where does Jerusalem get her glory from? It's because it's the city of God, isn't it? 
And that same glory, we're clothed in. We're clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness. We are accepted, we are clothed, we are beautiful in him. The church can actually be described as awesome as an army with banners. You know, you hear lots of bad talk about the church, don't you? But the true church, the true people of God are awesome as an army with banners. They are well beloved and Christ adores his church. I'm always very careful to speak too much about the church because it is the bride of Christ. It is awesome as an army, army with banners. In him it is spotless and pure. And now why does it describe the church as an army there? Well, the theologians used to describe the church in two ways. They would talk about the church triumphant, which are the saints in heaven. They're triumphant, they're resting, they're waiting for their blood to be avenged. They're waiting for Christ to return. All their warfare has ceased forever. But then the theologians also talked about the church militant. The church in this world, the church that is in exile, the church that is at war, the church that has a, a gospel to preach to every single nation. Pilgrims, exiles and strangers in a hostile land. That is what the church militant is. And as Christ looks at his people in this world, preaching the gospel, sharing the good news, he says, my bride is awesome as an army with banners. That's how Christ sees us. And the kids at their school, they used to sing, I'm in the Lord's army, yes sir. <laughs> I'm sure some of you guys will remember that song. It's something we've lost a little bit in the modern church, but we are an army, aren't we? Ezekiel 37, when the bones were raised up alive, it said they stood on their feet and it was, as it were, a great army. It's the word that we used to describe, to describe the church. Ephesians 6 again, it says that we're in a spiritual battle with the forces of evil. And so all this to say, when we come back to Christ, he forgives us of our sins, he assures us of his grace, and he says, I have a mission for you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. You're beautiful as Jerusalem, but you're also awesome as an army with banners. Go forth and tell the good news of my grace. All these things he says to his church and more. But what about verse 5 when Jesus says to his, his church, Turn your eyes away from me, for they overwhelm me. Now don't we sing on Sundays, turn your eyes upon Jesus? Aren't we always encouraging you to look to Christ? How is it that Jesus says, turn your eyes away from me? Well, the answer is actually in the Hebrew here. Uh, John Gill, who's a Hebrew scholar, he says, you could actually transla translate this very literally as turn about thine eyes over and against me. It means look all over me. Trust me, keep your eyes focused on me. It's what we see in Hebrews chapter 12 where it says, therefore let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He assures us of his grace, he assures us of our mission. He tells us, fix your eyes on me and keep moving forward. He speaks tenderly to his church. And just like the man who repeats his prayers from before, the, uh, the Lord Jesus, when we sin, his affection towards us is not changed. Uh, some people don't like that. They say it sounds like some kind of license to sin. But it's true. All the punishment for our sin, if we're a Christian, fell upon Jesus Christ. He took the full judgment, the full wrath for our sins. So yes, he gives us fatherly discipline and correction, but he never pours his wrath upon the Christian. His feelings to you are not changed when you sin. Now the true Christian here in that they say, praise the Lord, then I best go forward and serve him. The hypocrite says, well, I best get stuck in to some sin. His affection towards us is not changed at all when we sin. He still finds his church beautiful. He can still say, your hair is like a flock of goats descending the slopes of Gilead. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. You know, one of the reasons Christ's love for us never changes, it's because he can see the end from the beginning. He already knew all about your sins the first day you came to him. He knew every single sin you would ever commit and it was all paid for in full. 
He paid for all your sins, past, present, and future. That's what the Bible teaches very clearly. Past, present, and future. Our sins like a dark cloud, he has blotted them out. So he's not surprised when you mess up because he already knew it and he already made provision for it. And so he, he, he can, his feelings towards us don't change. He's not like one of those fickle relationships when you're at school. Oh, I'm going out with this person, now I'm with this person. He is committed to his bride forever. As it says in the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His love does not change, and therefore you, O Israel, are not destroyed. It says in the book of Malachi. Well, as we think about how bad we are sometimes, we think maybe Christ should just abandon us altogether. Go find a better bride for himself, maybe amongst some royal women. But just like the man in the story, just like the shepherd boy with his Shulamite, Christ does not want another woman. He only has eyes for his church. There are 60 queens, 80 concubines, there's all these celebrities and impressive people who don't know God. And yet Christ wants his church, his elect people who he chose before the foundation of the world. He doesn't want to trade you in because you're not everything you should be. Because this is an opportunity for God to show his grace to the whole creation. And so he can look at you and say, my dove, my perfect one. The only one pure to the mother who bought her. Now, how can Jesus speak about his church like that? When, you know, when she's full of heresy and sin and other things. It's because she is presented to him in his righteousness. It's because the Bible teaches something in, in Romans 5. If you don't know about this, you need to look it up. It teaches that God gives to his people the free gift of righteousness. The free gift of righteousness. It means that salvation is not a reward for your good behavior, for, for years of obedience, for anything like that. It is a free gift given to you the moment you believe. It's a wedding garment, or as we say in New Zealand, a kurawai, which you put on, and it covers your sin. The robes of righteousness. Because of those, Christ sees us, and he sees his own perfection staring back at him. And so he can say to his church, you are my dove, my perfect one, my pure one. Even though we're still sinners. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing to me. This is the gospel of God's grace. This is why Christ can say of his people, who is this who looks down like the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awesome as an army with banners. And all these words have meaning. You know, we'd probably be here for hours if we, would, if we delved into every single detail. But consider this, the moon has no light of itself, does it? We know this. The moon it reflects the light of the sun. And so the church is often compared to the moon in Scripture because the moon reflects the light of the sun. And in the same way, we are to reflect the light of Jesus Christ. We don't have any of our own light to shine, it comes from him. We reflect his glory as we come out with him, with his gospel. We go out shining like the sun, awesome as an army with banners. All this because Christ gives us the free gift of righteousness. These are amazing things. These are amazing things that God has done for us. Now, if you know anything about yourself, if you've been a Christian for longer than two minutes, you know that we go up and down in our spiritual journey. And it can be hard to believe that God really loves us as much as his word says that he does. It can be hard to believe that, can't it? Sometimes we're a bit like the woman, aren't we? We go and look at our relationship with God. We go down to the garden of our soul, as it were, and we take a look around and think, is there going to be any grace left for me? Is there going to be any mercy left for a sin of life? Is there going to be any affection from Christ to me? But if you're a Christian, when you go down again to that garden of your soul, when you bring the gospel to yourself, once again, you know, we're swept off our feet by his grace, aren't we? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 
You know, we come back like the prodigal son saying, Father, is there still a place left for me in the house? And he throws the robe on us. He gives us the ring, the sandals, all of it. He gives it to us freely. He sweeps us off our feet and he brings us up into that royal palace, which will eventually be the new heaven and the new earth. So like the woman, we sometimes fear it's all going to be gone, but Christ remains faithful. It says in the scripture, if we deny him, he will deny us. But if, we, if we're faithless, he will be faithful, for he cannot deny himself. His covenant will stand strong with those who have accepted the free gift of righteousness. For those who are still trying to earn a place in heaven, that's another matter altogether. And to those people, God will say, I never knew you depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. But to those who receive his grace, who give up all their own efforts and look to the cross, he will say, you are beautiful as Tisra, my love, awesome as an army with banners, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun. He will commit to you forever. Let's ask a few questions as we close this evening. Well, as we came to our passage tonight, we saw the gracious treatment of the shepherd boy to his spouse. It's a passage which shows us the beauty of true forgiveness and the beauty of reconciling after an argument. It's something those of us who are married need to take on board. A reconciliation after arguments, it's not an option, it's actually essential. This is why the Bible says in Psalm 4, and it's repeated in Ephesians 4, in your anger do not sin and do not let the sun go down While you are still angry, do not give the devil a foothold. We need to reconcile with our spouse when we have these arguments so that our prayer life and our spiritual lives are not affected. We are to bear with one another and forgive one another. And if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive just as the Lord forgave you. Colossians 3.14. It's not just good advice for married people, it's good advice for all of us. Forgive as Christ has forgiven you. But that all assumes that you've been forgiven by Christ, doesn't it? It assumes that you've believed his gospel, that you've come to him and believed on his cross. You know, if you come to Christ, he will forgive you. He'll keep no record of wrongs. He'll choose to to remember your sins against you no more. As far as the east is from the west, he'll separate your transgressions from you and he'll hurl your iniquities into the depths of the sea, never to be found again. He'll refuse to treat you as you deserve because of his own faithfulness and his love for you as his child. This is why Jesus taught those who are forgiven much, love much. To the degree that we're forgiven, to the degree that we know we're sinners who are saved by grace, to that degree we'll be able to love others and show the compassion of Christ. We're to love and forgive just as Christ has forgiven forgiven us. In this passage, we also see the amazing passion Jesus has for his bride. She is acceptable to him. She is spotless to him. She is pure to him. Let me ask you, my Christian friends, are you reminding yourselves of these things? Are you stirring yourselves up by way of reminder Are you, as Jude says, keeping yourselves in the love of God? Because we have to keep stirring ourselves up by reminder, don't we? We have to keep fighting those negative thoughts which tell us that Christ hurts us when we sin. We need to come back to his gospel, confess our sins, and receive his forgiveness afresh. He always receives us, he always loves us. His feelings towards us don't change one bit. Just one more quick illustration as we, before we close. All this is really played out in the book of Hosea, isn't it? The prophet Hosea is told by the Lord, he's told, go and marry a prostitute, a woman who's going to be unfaithful to you. And so Hosea takes Goma to be his wife. And sure enough, she cheats on him. She commits adultery. She goes off with another man and leaves Hosea for Sarkin. The book goes on a little bit and Hosea is at the slave market and he sees his ex-wife for sale. And and she's pretty haggard now because she's half price, 15 shekels of silver. And what does God say to Hosea? 
He says, go show your love to your wife again, even though she's loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. And what does he do? He goes to the slave market and he redeems her. He buys her back and he says, you're mine. Now I want you to live for me. Stay with me forever. Don't cheat on me again. It's a wonderful picture of Christ, isn't it? The true husband. Well, like the bride, it wanders off all over the place. He is the Lord who brings us back. He calls us back into that marriage bond all the time. He renews his covenant with us and he says, play the whore no longer. Stay with me, be obedient to me, stay under the safety of my roof. So what are we to do with this truth that God always brings us back? Uh, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. This truth that Christ is the forgiving husband is meant to motivate us to fresh obedience and fresh love for him. As we meditate on this, we're to go out into the world awesome as an army with banners. Uh, People may think we're insane, they may think we've lost the plot, but Christ knows you if you're a Christian. He delights in you, he sends you out in his name. I pray that all of us would live in this glorious reality and that all of us would know the free forgiveness that comes through trusting in the work of Jesus Christ and his cross. Amen.